All right, it's 1.30. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to the third session of the UC SEREP Racial Equity and Extension webinar series. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide Integrated Pest Management Pro Program, and I'm coming to you today from the ancestral lands of the Nishanan and Wintun nations. I'm also here with Sonia Brote of the UC Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, who will be telling us a little more about the webinar series before we get started and Julia Kalika from our program support unit, who will be providing um, our, our technical, technical support today. Um, so before we get started, I want to cover a few important details for this webinar. You won't be able to use your microphone during the webinar. If you have questions for any of the panelists or if you have technical problems, please use the Q&A and that's located in the Zoom navigation bar. We'll also use the chat feature to share any resources or organizations that are mentioned. Uh, live automated captions are being provided for the webinar. If you do not wish to see those, you can uh, shut them off by clicking CC live captions and, uh, and then clicking hide captions. Uh, we are recording the webinar, so you'll be able to go back and listen to any part of it if you wish to do so. And the recording will be made available on the UCANR YouTube channel. Uh, and we'll add that to the chat sh shortly. Um, at the end of the webinar, we'll add a link to the chat for a feedback survey that you can use to let us know how this webinar went or how it could be improved. Please fill that survey out to let us know how we did. And if you haven't already done so, please uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat with your name, pronouns, and the tribal land that you are occupying. And you can learn more about whose tribal lands you are on by going to native-land.ca and entering your location. Okay. Um, so before we get into the content, I want to pass the mic over to Sonia for a minute to tell us uh, more about the Racial Equity and Extension series before we get started. Sonia, you want right. to take it? Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. I'm Sonia. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm coming to you today from the city of Davis, which occupies the homelands of the Patuan people. So I'd really like to welcome everyone, and I'd most especially like to thank our two panelists, Carly and Ade, for making time to talk with us today. So as part of my work with UC Serap, I co-coordinate the California Professional Development Program of Western SARE, which is USDA's Western Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program. And that's the program that has provided the funding for the six part webinar series that this is part of today. So I'd like to acknowledge that. I would also very quickly like to mention that there are new funds available for professional development projects targeting extension professionals in California. Um, and we are taking grant applications until October 15th. So um, after, after my introduction here, I'll be putting a link into the chat where you can find out how to apply for those if you're interested. So now turning to the topic for today, I've been working with the university for, I guess a couple decades now, and I know that the University of California prides itself on doing work grounded in science. Um, but science does not have to come just from the university. To me, science is about observing the world and forming ideas about it, which is something that all cultures all over the world have been doing for eons. If we as extension professionals um, want to make meaningful relationships and have meaningful relationships with people who steward the land, I think it is always good extension practice to be aware of and respectful of the knowledge people bring and the world views that shape their identities and the decisions that they make on the land. And this is even more important when we're talking about indigenous people and wanting to work with them because their perspectives have often not been heard and they're often not part of our mainstream university educations as extension professionals these days. And how much more important is it when we're talking about sustainability because as we know, indigenous people have a much longer history of managing these landscapes and they may bring something very different to the table. So for all these reasons, we at UC Serap are undertaking this learning journey and invite you today to join us on this part of our path. So thank you all for coming and I'll turn it back over to Stephanie. All right, thank you, Sonia. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists for this session. 
Our panelists are Ade Romero Briones, uh, Director of Programs for the First Nations De Development Institute, and Carly Dominguez, PhD student in the Department of Native American Studies at UC Davis. Uh, and we'll start by having each of our panelists introduce themselves and their background. Um, Ade, would you like to start us off? Yes, thank you. Can you see me? Could, oh, there I am. Yes, we um, can see you. Goethe say hopa, hen weka nima esa wayats, kuti dime osuta koi mohada. So I'm Ade Romero Briones. I am um, from Cochiti, Pueblo, New Mexico, and I am also Kiowa from the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma. I am married uh, to Fred Briones from Lake Port, California, Big Valley Rancheria, and I'm calling in from Lodi, California, where we have um, an office for First Nations Development Institute. I'm the director of the Food and Agricultural Program for First Nations and the co-director of the California Tribal Fund, both organizations in First Nations. Um, we have an office here in Lodi, and we also have an office um, in Claremont, California. My co-director is Rebecca Tordes, and I'm so happy um, and excited to talk with you all today. I'll pass it to Carly. Good afternoon, everyone. Saludos, hatu hatu. Thank you so much for um, all the introductions, including today. It's nice to read them in the chat. My name, as was said, is Carly Dominguez. I'm currently in Davis as well, which is Patwin Lands. Um, I'm in my second year as a PhD student here and uh, previously earned a master's in American Indian Studies as well. And um, I was born and raised in our homelands in Northern Santa Barbara County, which is Chumash homelands. So that's a little bit about um, my personal background. So I was raised um, just kind of knowing um, the local waterways and understanding that I was in an indigenous place in Northern Santa Barbara County and San Luis Obispo County. And um, I'd like to recognize that I'm always learning. And um, I think that's something that uh, really influences me as a PhD student and me as a community member. And as we go over our talk today, you'll see that I've had some academic experiences as well as community experiences or non-academic experiences that have also really informed my understanding of food systems and agriculture for indigenous people. Um, I'll share that I interned with um, the Intertribal Agricultural Council and the Chumash Environmental Office at the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians, as well as the Natural Resource Conservation Services Agency. And I want to share that because that's where a lot of my um, knowledge about contemporary systems, um, food systems comes from. Thank you, everyone. It's so good to see you. Thank you for coming. All right, thank you both. And I think we have a poll question to bring up before we get started with the panel questions. Um, so we'll bring that up right now. And if you can't see the poll question, um, I'll add it to the chat. And if, if for any reason you can't see it because of pop-up blockers, you know, feel free to send in your answer directly to the, uh, through the chat. Um, so this question is, how many times have you interacted with, tribal, uh, with a tribal or indigenous community or producer? And we'll leave that up a little bit longer. Okay, so we have a lot of people who have interacted with tribal or indigenous communities one to five times, some that have uh, interacted with them five to 10 times, and then some more than 10 times. So this is great. Thank you for answering that. Um, okay, so before, so, so with that, um, let's start our panel discussion. Um, our first question is, um, many uh, practices that are regenerative for soil and ecosystem health are gaining popularity in the movement for sustainable agriculture. How are these practices rooted in indigenous history and land management? And how can we better acknowledge the indigenous roots of these practices when we are doing the work of extension? Um, sure, I will take a stab and Carly, you can jump in um, where you see fit. Uh, so this question, when I first read this question, like my, my focus auto automatically went on the word rooted um, 
because there is an assumption that the practices in regenerative or sustainable agriculture are rooted in indigenous practices. And we talked about this a little bit in our pre-panel is, um, in my mind, they're very distinct because ooh, I grew up in Cochiti, Pueblo, New Mexico, which is was primarily a subsistence agricultural community. We are a Pueblo, so we've been practicing agriculture since time immemorial. And um, you know, we have stories about how our people cultivated corn and helped other people cultivate corn. I mean, it's a very much part of, of who we are. But when I look at my own community and our practices, they're very distinct from the practices I see um, across the mainland. And part of that is that when we're talking about sustainable and regenerative agriculture, they're sort of still in the same vein of that mainstream agriculture. They're either a reaction to it, they're in response to it, there is this, um, they're somewhat connected, there's still concepts that are, are very much um, connected when you talk about regenerative and sustainable agriculture, but when we're talking about Pueblo agriculture, when we're talking about indigenous food systems, they're rooted in something entirely different. They're really outside of that conversation, outside of those models. And actually the mainstream model was um, used almost as a way to displace the indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous food systems. And so they're not really rooted. Um, these practices are not really rooted in indigenous agriculture. They're actually meant to displace indigenous agriculture and food systems. And so when we're talking about regenerative or sustainable agriculture, um, it's really important to recognize the differences. And that begs the question, like if you haven't experienced indigenous food systems, if you haven't participated in indigenous agricultural systems, how can we recognize the differences? And therein, I think, has a lot of potential for extension to explore. Um, but, but before I go any further, I'll pass it to Carly, because we could talk about this all day long. Absolutely. I know we could just keep going and going. <laughs> Um, so I'll just add, I think, uh, what jumps out to me is just um, remembering sort of our distinct traditions, um, but the, and, and that currently they, they exist simultaneously. I won't exactly say side by side, but that these, these systems exist simultaneously. And um, thank you so much for sharing a day about Xochitl Pueblo and um, you know, I really appreciate you bringing that that knowledge to this space, and um, and I'm thinking a little bit about um, here in, in in California, which is a huge state, of course. So it's like thinking, you know, um, just about food systems and um, hearing food systems, and also agriculture in California, um, because that's this is where we are right now. So I'm thinking a little bit about um, some of the places where um, I'm, I'm just thinking. Uh, sorry, just one moment. OK. About um, different traditions that you you mentioned the displacement a little bit. And so sorry to fumble over my words <laughs> there, but um, just thinking about how um, certain agriculture and food systems might be used to displace and thinking that recognizing that that has happened here in California with our food systems, um, but that people are still are here um, and, and want the food systems. And some folks are even actively uh, working with those food systems. If you happen to be in the Berkeley area or Oakland area, you may have heard of the Ohlone Cafe. So those are folks that are bringing back um, some food systems. And so I find, I mentioned California because I find this is like a way that we can recognize that um, we are in indigenous land in California and that there is an agricultural and food system here in California that is distinct from the American European um, food systems. And saying that, I, I think it's also important to recognize that in California, we, um, 
We also have many indigenous people here from other parts of the world, from Mexico, for example, Guatemala, I mean, other parts of the United States. I want to share when I'm thinking about retracing roots that I'm seeing the world and I'm seeing the different um, indigenous people throughout the world. Not, so that's not necessarily contemporary national borders, <laughs> you know, so I'm thinking of um, the different the indigenous communities along, along with the national borders, but I'm mentioning this so we can really think and envision that there are distinct people throughout uh, California, the United States, Mexico and Canada and beyond um, besides just the, um, the national uh, borders that you may see. So when I'm thinking about retracing roots, I'm thinking about remembering that, um, for example, Bay areas where Ohlone communities are, um, Los Angeles areas where Tongva communities are, and um, so that in each of these places, there are a California indigenous tradition, and also there might be some traditions from other indigenous places um, as well. And I think I can stop, or I guess I'll just, you know, mention a little bit more about um, the Western, Western or an American agriculture that's here in California, um, that that, uh, agricultural system. I participated in that agricultural system actually as a worker. So a lot of my experience comes from that and just recognizing that um, it's a robust economy, but th that there's oftentimes need for support from the federal government. There's need for subsidies and all those kinds of things. So um, can we think about a local food system that maybe is focused also on indigenous food system and agriculture? Um, and I think with that, I can go ahead and and see if there's anything else you want to add to that a day and we can keep talking. Yeah. Um, well, I have a funny story about this because um, in the California Tribal Fund, uh, Cal Rebecca Tortoise, who's in our Claremont office, she was the former director of the California Indian Basket Weavers Association. And my husband was a board member of the California Indian Basket Weavers Association. But before we get, I get into my story, I would be remiss if I didn't take some time to recognize um, that California had a great loss recently. I mean, we're always having great losses, but Marie Wilcox, from the Wakchumni people um, in Tulare County recently passed away. And she was like, she was a matriarch of her community. She was one of the last remaining Wakchumni fluent speakers. Um, and the Wakchumni people are in the heart of the agricultural breadbasket of America. And if you want to see the distinct, the distinctions between an indigenous food system and Western agriculture, whether we call it regenerative or sustainable. Um, you, the story of the Wakchumni people and many other displaced tribes in the Central Valley tell that story. And they're still, they're still around. Um, Marie Wilcox and her family were actually some of the first migrants in the agricultural system in California before um, other, other immigrant populations came in. The first migrant population for agriculture was indigenous people that were being displaced off their land in order to put what we now know as some of the, the most fertile, fertile grounds, fertile farmlands in, in all of America. And Marie Wilcox was from this era. And many of her stories talk about that transition from the indigenous food system to the agricultural empire in the Central Valley that we see today. And she recently passed. And so I think her life and her story very much hit on this topic. And it, 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 it's just time to recognize and put names to the people and to the places that we're talking about. So before my story is about the California Tribal Fund because I was having this discussion with some of the people we serve in California. And I said, well, I'm doing this webinar on agriculture. Like, what do you think I could say? And these are all indigenous people who like practice their food systems, who practice traditional food, food system, cooking, gathering, hunting, and 
by far, all of their reaction was like, well, agriculture, I don't really know who does that. Like in our communities or I don't like, I don't know anybody who does agriculture. And to me, that was telling because these are all people who are very knowledgeable about their lands, very knowledgeable about their environments, very knowledgeable about their traditional foods. And none of them considered themselves part of the agricultural community. So that in itself says like, there is this very distinct nomenclature about how we're describing the foods we eat and the food systems we participate in. And so there's this assumption in the Western world that like agriculture is, is growing food. That's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily cross over to indigenous communities because even that language is a separation of how we envision our relationships with our foods and lands and people. Carly, did you wanna add anything or should I move on to the next question? Thank you so much, by the way. I was just thinking, I'm so glad that you shared that story. And then I hope that we can remember that as we go through this discussion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, you know what? I did want to just add like one little thing just to get some kind of tan uh, uh, maybe a vision or a tangible, um, more tangible picture of what food might be in California. I think we'll talk about this a little bit more, but we're all very familiar with the many oak trees that we have here in California. And so, um, you know, one of the foods that takes time to prepare, it's, it's very different from um, any food that any, any food that you'd buy at the, the grocery store is um, acorns. And that's a staple food product for most California Indians. And I just, I just think that's, you know, that's part of it. So you can start to kind of see how robust our food system is if you think about all the oaks. And, you know, some are tended and unfortunately some are not tended, but that's just, I just wanted to add a little visual and, you know, um, can, you can also think about, I'm just gonna say a few more. You can also just think about seaweed. These are things that you see everywhere in California, but you might not necessarily know or think of as the food system. So those are just a few things to put a visual to what a day has been saying. Thank you so much. Um, okay, um, so our next question um, is the promotion of sustainable agriculture tends to focus heavily on the agricultural practices themselves, but not so much on the worldviews that drive those actions. Um, do in, how do indigenous philosophies and worldviews about tending the land connect with sustainable crop production and land stewardship? And I realize that this is kind of contradictory to what we've just been saying. So, you know, keep that in mind as we're moving forward too. <laughs> Uh, I can just jump in right now and um, kind of continue about what I just mentioned, um, thinking about what are the indigenous California foods. And um, when we think about that, I think, you know, how do I say, like the sort of one of the major differences between um, California indigenous food and maybe sustainable agriculture is that in California, indigenous food, you are, you are placed in California and you are thinking about, um, or I am thinking about the plants that are actually from California. I'm thinking about the seaweed, the live oaks, like I'm thinking about those plants um, and, and I'm concerned about them being plentiful, not only for me, but for generations in the past and generations to come. Um, and, and so the the actual food product doesn't come from another place. <laughs> that makes sense. So like kale and lettuce is all healthy and great, but it's not actually from the California forest um, or land. It, it's hard for me to, it's almost like the English language doesn't quite give me what I need to even explain this, but I think that's one of the things. Um, and, and I'm not, if I'm thinking about you know, indigenous California food, I'm not thinking about selling it at market. I'm not thinking about the economy. Um, I'm thinking about keeping our human food, po human population healthy and good relationships with um, the water, the air and all the animals. And, and, and I say good relationships, but that takes time, right? That takes commitment, that takes tending. And um, I have a little bit more to say about this, but I think a day also has um, some, some stuff to say about this as well. 
So we're talking about worldviews. So let's like pause for a second because we do have to get something straight here. Agriculture, as we know it, when we think of agriculture, most people think of like row cropping, most people think of the tractor, most people think of like corn, um, you know, if you're into regenerative agriculture or sustainable agriculture, it may look slightly different, but not too much. We still have, we are still basing our concepts on very fundamental things in the American legal system. One, we're talking about private property. We're talking about the naming of inputs, right? Which is land, which is labor, which is water, which is seeds and soil. And we see this even in the sustainable and regenerative agriculture space where we, where, where we say soil health and, um, all of that to say like it's a very sterile approach to how the world of foods and agriculture in the European sense. So when you're talking to indigenous people, the worldview is very, very different. There's a relationship with your water. There's a relationship with your food, whether that be elk, whether that be seaweed, whether that be acorns, whether it be the corn my grandpa grows, there's a relationship. Um, we've named that concentric ecology and that's really taken from Enrique Salmon who's at um, UC, one of the, no, Cal State. And so when we're talking about concentric ecology, it's the idea that we're related to these elements that agriculture often names as inputs. And let's talk about soil health, for example. I'll, this is a really good example. Um, there's a young man named Sam, Sam Barr. If you don't know um, who tr the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer is for your area, you should probably learn because they're really fascinating and they have so much knowledge about the specific lands in place that many of the farms or agricultural places um, that we name agricultural places. Um, so if you didn't know who your tribal historic preservation officer is, you should probably find out. Sambar is a tribal historic preservation officer um, in the Pacific North, Northwest. And he said, you know, when I talk, when people come and talk about soil as a tribal historic preservation officer who's responsible for caretaking of like the archeological artifacts of my tribe, it gets really frustrating because we always come into contention in the plow zone. So it's the layer of, of earth. And you know, most people call it topsoil. It's the layer of earth where a lot of um, art of like archeological remains and artifacts are found. And he says, you know, this, this is like a lot of farmers come to me because they find bones when they're plowing. They find pots and shards and arrowheads and they want to know what to do with it. But he's like, it's really frustrating because this is the exact zone that most people talk about soil health. And his, and he, he said it quite succinctly. He was like, they, they call it soil. I call it the bones of my people because when you think about how long it takes for a human body to actually um, degrade into soil, depending on where you are, it's as little as 30 years. So when we're talking about soil health, you're talking about the bones of my ancestors. And so that relationship is, it's a connection. So I can't talk about soil health without acknowledging that I'm related to this piece of land that we're talking about. And so the sterileness of the conversation definitely changes because that implies a responsibility for not only the caretaking of your people and your future people and your past people, but it creates a direct relationship that we are then responsible to, to respond to. And when we think about the way, the worldviews of that, that is the exact worldview that was meant to be displaced by agriculture. I mean, the history of UC extension itself was created so that you know you could acculturate slaves after reconstruction and in that same vein that's when indigenous kids were being sent to boarding school 
and the United States were like, hey, we already have an education program for freed slaves. We got to actually put like Indian kids in this program because they'll acculturate them too. And so the Hampton Institute in Virginia was one of the first places you saw freed slaves and indigenous children being taught Western forms of agriculture in the hopes that they would become civilized and actually go back to their communities and spread that civilization. So it was great. It, it, agriculture, again, was a displacement in how indigenous people participated and practiced worldviews. And when we talk about sustainable agriculture and practices, we have to remember that it's somewhat rooted, not only in displacement, but it's rooted in the idea that the people have to be separated from their culture. And when people are separated from the culture, it becomes a much more sterile conversation. And we can't move forward unless we acknowledge that that's kind of where the roots of agriculture are. And so when there's this resistance in indigenous people to be seen as agriculturalists or farmers, it's from there. Like it's a long standing conversation and it's, it's had violent times, it's had very sad times. And um, even today we carry that. As a new extension agent who maybe graduated from college, maybe last week, maybe, um, you still have that history to contend with. I still have the history that I have to contend with with my own people. And um, lastly, I'll end with this. I'm talking a lot. I'm, so my last story is that when, and Stephanie knows this because I shared this with other extension agents, in my language, we call the extension agent, agents the people who kill the fruit, fruit trees, because in the, 19, in the 1940s, extension agents, along with NRCS, came into our community and said, you know what, Cochiti farmers, you need to be more efficient. You need to be more productive in how you're practicing agriculture. And your way of watering your fields is like inefficient. You're losing water. And so what we're going to do for you is we're going to concrete all your irrigation ditches um, because it's better for you. And of course, they came and concreted this, these these irrigation ditches, the farmers were very upset. Within three years, all of the fruit trees, wild fruit trees in our community died, which was very near and dear to many of our grandparents' hearts, um, produced and sustained many children um, of my grandparents' generation. So many stories about these fruit trees. Most of them died, if not all. Um, when the fruit trees died, the birds no longer came. When the birds no longer came, the predators no longer came. And so our entire ecosystem was changed. And from that day on, any extension agent that came to our community was named, oh, that's those are the people who kill the fruit trees. And like to this day, 2021, that's what they're called in my community. And again, like we, we may find ourselves in 2021 having very, open conversations about what our food system should be like, but we do have all this history, institutional history that needs to be contended with in these conversations. Yeah, I think recognizing, as you said, the, the institutional history that needs to be recognized, that's absolutely true. And just to underscore that. And or just to yeah I agree completely with that and it's almost got me like a little bit stumped to like okay where do we go you know what do we do or it do, and those are just some questions to that initial um yeah to what you said initially and and I just I, I want this like kind of like <laughs> I don't know of a hold space or what it is that, that that's just heartbreaking that that should never happen um that we should never lose our fruit trees ever and and it happened right um but just for yeah, I had that impacted me to hear you tell that story. Um, it, but Carly in California, right? The, there's like oak trees, elderberry <laughs> trees. I mean, and Sonia's on the line, and she's I I consider her the elderberry grandmother, godmother. <laughs> All of these trees that are very important to indigenous people were often displaced 
mm -hmm. again the word displaced mm -hmm. for 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 agriculture like you yeah. tear out trees so you can grow so they your plants have more sun like that's a very violent approach mm -hmm. to your relationship with land when you rip out trees when you're ripping and and i know like that's not necessarily how western folks may view agriculture um but there are public stories from my own community from my husband's community who talk about the times where they came and they cut down the biggest pine trees that gave them the most pine nuts in the fall because they had to be removed because they blocked out the sun for the the trees that were being planted in lake county i mean it's like we see the conflicts, the points of conflicts. We hear the stories of the points of conflict. They're not often acknowledged. So I think one of the points of agriculture education that needs to happen is like acknowledging when those points of conflict actually are occurring. If we're talking about resources that are being used to supplant other ways of living, um, whether or not you know, they're right or wrong, like the conversation at the very least should be had. And we see we see those conflicts constantly in California. Can I ask you both, um, Adey and Carly, given that clearly this history of violence must be acknowledged, is there anything you can think of that people like myself and the colleagues on this call is there any way that we, something we can do to approach um, indigenous groups to, or what can we do to signal a genuine interest in maybe moving beyond the violence or really listening? I understand if you see one of us, there's probably a lot of bad association. So what can we do? Or is it that we need to wait for you all to come to us or what advice can you give? <laughs> Um, I'll just jump in, Carly, please jump in at any time. Um, well, that poll was really fascinating to me because when you get down to five to 10 times, you see that the numbers drop down to 10%. I, the people who said five to 10 times, like, I don't know who you are out there, but like, bless you. Like these are, we're dealing with histories I, I carry my history, you carry your history, even if we don't know what that history is. Like we're, we're social beings that come from a place, that come from a people, um, even if we don't know what that is. Like, so meeting in this place to have conversations, and if we have conflicting history, which often happens when you have non-Indigenous and Indigenous people in the room, it's very uncomfortable because we are, we're, we're coming with all of that and it's going to be really hard it's not an easy conversation um but that that shouldn't negate the responsibility we have to have those conversations and with indigenous people there's like trust that definitely has to be built we don't and we as as someone who works with indigenous people like constantly all day even I, as an Indigenous people, need to recognize sometimes I have to meet with people up to 12 times before we actually start talking about the work that I initially talk, wanted to talk to them about. It's because like I have to build enough trust and, in, and in, enough face in this community, even if it's another Indigenous community, to actually start having real conversations because they're going to trust that when it gets hard, that I'm not going to just like ghost and disappear and not come back because like we've made that commitment to each other. It's almost and like that commitment is, is really, really important. And that takes time. That takes more than one or two meetings. That takes more than one phone call. That takes more than like one hour site visit. Like it, it it's a serious commitment that has to be considered if we really want to have these conversations with one another. It, that, that was one of the things that jumped out or jumps out to me as one of the first things to say is just that relationships take time and trusting relationships take time. I, I, and um, 
And um, I just, I think that that's, that's just it. There's an, you know, um, and that we don't control time, you know, it just, I can't control how many, how much time it's going to take for me to create relationships or, or, you know, and also, but, and, and that being said, like, if that's something that you're really interested in doing, then like, you know, you have your path laid out for you, you know, it's not going to be a year. I mean, who knows how long it's going to be. Right. And also, I just want to recognize that, um, that, that maybe we have to do more thinking about this, you know, what the, the answer to this question is kind of like, well, maybe it needs to be part of a strategic planning process. Maybe it has to be, you know, um, it, I just have su suggestions, you know, I don't have an answer because I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not in your place. <laughs> so I'm just in my place, right? So it's just, it's just hard for me to, to think about what can you do? I think attending this webinar is is part of it, you know, and and recognizing the awful history is part of it. And oh, one one thing I mean that's been helpful for me just along the way as I met multiple different people. Um, sometimes non-indigenous people just like really want to know where I'm from and they want to know all about me, and 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 that's great. And and but I think that like. It's also important that that maybe non indigenous people know a little bit about them and themselves and where they came from, like if you're expecting knowledge from one person or a, you know, a personal history about one person also make sure to to know your your history a little bit, where did you come. Okay, Ohio. Hmm, okay, well that's a native that's a native place too. maybe before Ohio you came from New York and before New York you came from you know wherever it was that you came from so knowing a little bit about our histories in general can be can be helpful. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that there's a lot more thinking and collaboration that needs to be done about this. Um, I, I was reflecting a little bit because I think we talked that this might be a question that we'd have. And, um, I know that, um, the Natural Resource Conservation Service Agency, the same res the agency that, you know, killed the trees in Sochi and has done, I think they also... Anyways, I won't get into it, but since um, 2015, the California state has been having a tribal advisory committee um, and that's taken, you know, I don't know how many years, how much staff there they had one tribal liaison, you know, there's there's models for ways to. To um, have professionals and staff in your organization, if, if this is if this is really a, a value or this is, you know, something that you want to implement I think I think it should be <laughs> um, but there's models for staff I think and then of course um, funding opportunities I think those are just a few things and there's so many more and this is such a larger conversation that I encourage us all to continue to have um yeah I'll, I'll just add one thing and this is like a personal observation and yeah. not necessarily applied to like other tribal communities but I get asked this all the time and they say all the time like I can probably say 10 times a week and the question is always well where do I go to learn about indigenous food practices and indigenous agricultural practices where can I go to learn um and I always have to pause because even when we state it and frame it in that way, we are already separating people from their practices. Like if the question is, do you want to practice indigenous food ways without indigenous people, then you would ask it in that way. You would ask like, where can we find indigenous practice? Because you're not asking to find indigenous people, you're asking about their practices which in itself is sort of extractive. And I'm totally overthinking that, but maybe not because a lot of indigenous people react the same way, like our nomenclature in this space. And it's not the fault of the person asking it. To me, it's like the system of agriculture, which focuses on practices and commodities and systems of production, as opposed to the people who are part of it. And so when we, have to rethink how we come into this space. One of the things we have to rethink is like, how are we approaching 
people and farmers and indigenous people? Like, how are we creating like such circumstances in which people are not part of the equation when we're talking about agriculture? And that's like readily apparent when I get the question of where can I find more, more information about indigenous practices? That reminds me of a story a day about that I have about, you know, um, I, I participated in the UC California natural or California naturalist program at UC Santa Cruz. And so it's all about California native plants. You, you learn, and I was really excited to learn more. And, you know, and I just, it was, it was, there was a level of trauma that I experienced because we were talking about the plants all the time and never the people. Like we would talk about oak trees and not the not the, the system of California natives. It would have been Ohlone people, Alma Mutsin, I was in Santa Cruz, that tend those oak trees, you know? Um, I mean, it just made like, to me, it just made no sense. How can we talk about California native people without, or California native plants, I'm sorry, without native people? And, you know, I'll also add, um, Later on, I was able to retake this course with the Wishtoyo Chumash Foundation. So, it, it, you know, the you I don't know exactly how that came to be. I don't know exactly how UC Naturalist then expanded to have an indigenous only UC Naturalist program, but I was able to participate in that program as well and it, with extremely different outcomes, right? Because the people that were participating, we all knew that we had a long tradition or a long, and tradition isn't the right word. It's like 10,000 years of building relationships with, you know, plants and animals and each other. And and so um, that's just, I just wanted to share that as like, a, okay, if we're talking about California native plants, which is huge, there's native plant society, there's all these things. Let's think about the people and let's also connect it to food systems. Um, and, and beyond that, there's medicine and all these things that, you know, I just need to mention, but won't get into the details, but it's important to mention that. Yeah, that's so, oh, sorry, a date, were you going to say something? I was going to say, you know, California Naturalist is also within extension programs as well. So that's really important to keep in mind. Yeah, um, a day, I, if you want to continue, I can. No, you're good? Okay, okay. Um, we do have a follow-up question in the, in the Q&A here. And uh, it relates to what you said a day about um, talking about things in a very sterile way. And the question is, what are less sterile ways we can talk about soil in the context of land stewardship without appropriating ind indigenous culture? That's a really, really important question. Um, and, you know, we have these conversations in indigenous communities all the time because, um, you know, there's in order to have these conversations, there's a lot of work that needs to be done both on the people practicing or coming from like a Western world worldview and even indigenous people have to do work on our end and it's messy. It's, it's gonna be messy. The interactions are gonna be hard and it's gonna be uncomfortable for both parties. Um, and so when we talk about appropriation, like, it's appropriation if you're not in conversation with indigenous people from that land. It's appropriation if you're having land acknowledgements and it's a room full of white people without any indigenous people. Like when you have, when you're, when you don't have like the conversation or dialogue going with an indigenous person about that land, about that stewardship, about that place, then it's probably appropriation. And so really like, and for, for me, and I've even had to check myself, like getting asked really simple questions um, about indigenous practice, indigenous food ways. Like I do have to be patient because if somebody's really coming to learn, like I, I, I myself can't react um, too harshly. But again, we're coming with our histories where like, it, it's it's not been we haven't been able to bridge those conversations and so we're at 2021 where we do have to recognize the uncomfortable and do have to recognize the messiness of having these conversations and it may entail some appropriation it may entail 
that um, somebody gets scolded for not using the, the same language. But again, if you have a relationship and commitment and dialogue going, like you can get over that. It may be hard, but you can get through that. Carly, did you wanna add anything? Or should I move on to the next question? Okay. Um, so we have another question that we have planned. Um, one is, uh, it's, it's how can indigenous ways of knowing about land management be better incorporated into extension research and programming? Okay, so again, like some people think like a day, like, yes, I'm talking too much, but thank you for, for indulging me this, this short time. So when we talk about extension research and programming, I've never seen this. I've seen this one time from a retired extension agent in the Pacific Northwest, who gave a historical a historical overview of extension. And they took it all the way back to like its roots in um, reconstruction and how, you know, it was an educational program um, created to civilize an entire population of like freed slaves coming from the South. Um, you know, extension, and again, um, I we talk about Coach T and the ones who killed the fruit trees. That was, you know, like some of these instances that dot extension history are not often discussed or taught anywhere. And so um, not having that history up front or readily available or like even part of the conversations make it really hard to go into communities that have had negative experiences with extension. And so part of the programming should include these, these historical, even if it's a webinar, even if it's a PowerPoint, even if it's a one pager, like start somewhere to recognize that there has been damage that has been caused by extension. That's really important. Like. You know, I, I, and then the other part is like extension is very much much tied to academia, and again, there's a there's a long history of acad academic like elitism. Um, our whole our entire university system was was supplanted from Europe. You know, it was the it was a wet European model that was created because the American civilization or like the indigenous people who were stewarding lands, the indigenous people who are already here um, were thought to be inferior, their knowledge systems inferior. So like, why should we even listen to them about the plants and the animals? Because, you know, we have these things from Europe we have to bring, bring over and that, that followed bringing over but plants, you know, there's eco ecological colonization, there's animal colonization, there's educational colonization, like all of these are kind of tied into a ball. And when we come and talk about lands and education and extension, like, oh my gosh, that's a Pandora's box. But just ignoring mm -hmm. that box is really hard to actually have real conversations when you go into communities that know this history and are like generational products of this history. And, you know, so that's like a start. That, that's like for me, number one. But before I go any further, Carly, please jump in. I'm just thinking about, um, I think it was mentioned earlier that I, I think actually, Sonja, you mentioned that. Um, agriculture looks to science and scientific data. Um, and so also I'm working a little bit as a Native American studies student, um, PhD student, and how can we um, use academic research methods that allow for um, other ways of making knowledge, right? So in our community, not only Native American communities, but also in Black communities, um, a lot of our knowledge, our African American communities, a lot of our knowledge is held by our elders who are not in academia, right? So um, I'm just looking at ways that that those who want to engage respectfully <laughs> with this knowledge 
could do so in an academic setting. And, you know, I'm early on in my PhD uh, study, so I don't want to say that I'm going to find that that's even going to be possible, right? Like this is an ongoing conversation. These are messy conversations. I don't know that I necessarily want um, oral tradition to be in be in academia, you know. So there's questions about respect and eth ethics that are, that are happening. So I mean that that's an <laughs> you know that's a possibility. How can it better be incorporated? Maybe it shouldn't be better <laughs> incorporated. You know, these I'm a PhD student, so I can kind of I, like get to ask these kinds of questions. Um, but it's, you know, these are, um, as Aday was saying, there has been, you know, this tradition of also looking at Indigenous people as like less than and not knowing. So um, that's, and that's completely wrong, right? So, but thinking about, you know, we have to rectify that in academia, or do we have to rectify that in academia? I mean, that's a question because I can say that that's important to me as a Native American studies student. However, I can't say that biology or biochemistry wants to do that, you know, so um, that they're really, you know, when you start talking about research and it's just all kinds of questions come to mind, especially because also because the university has traditionally disenfranchised and not been a, and is not a welcoming place for native students, you know, so these are things we have to contend with um, in the research space. Um, what else? So, yeah, I don't know, but I think that also, I think that having this webinar and, and the people that are attending, like, obviously there's interest and obvious, and I hope that there's commitment and responsibility and respect around these things. And, and I thought, I thought of something, um, to pick, to go back to the last question of what can we do to learn about indigenous food? You can, if you haven't yet, you can click on the link that, um, Stephanie put earlier, if, if you don't know which native land you're on, that's a really also it could be an important piece in your journey to, you know, support indigenous agriculture. Um, that was kind of an aside. Um, yes, that's I think that's about all I have to say better. Better incorporated and maybe even talk to like the UC naturalist program and like what happened there and how and why they created that relationship with Wishtoyo and how they were able to do that to have an indigenous focused um, UC naturalist I'm sure there's you, you know, have those meetings it's, it's like what can you, you know, it's like what can you do, you can do the same thing that you do when you're trying to solve other problems you have committee meetings you have you form a committee, you have committee meetings you make an action plan, hopefully you follow up on those action plans, you know. Um, so I think sometimes the question, you know, the questions are asked and it's like, OK, well, this is a, a, a problem or this is something we need to solve, just like any other problems we need to solve. Like, OK, we need to figure out our budget. So we're going to have meetings <laughs> to figure out our budget. Right. We're going to have spreadsheets. I mean, it, it's not exactly like a budget, but I think that there's already a lot of resources also to sort of um, incorporate these t the, the types of uh, webinars or these re and you know research also i'll just say thinking about research you know i know that sometimes things take people get grants for like 10 years or 20 years to study like you know um, insects in a grass field you know possibly maybe it would be possible to put out a call for applications where you would want native people to study the grasslands in california because grasslands is a very important food that we often don't have access to because the grasslands have been destroyed by cattle, by um, housing development, by cities, by streets, all these things, right? Um, so anyways, there's just some a call for proposals to study grasslands, you know, for 10 years, focus on indigenous, um, with a focus on indigenous folks, you know, that's just an idea. Um, and I think just because I'm in research right now, I'm, I'm kind of think of those long scale things, you know, I see people with these long term research um, programs, right? Um, so possibly making, oh, you know, actually I do have an idea also. We worked with like having PIs, right? So your PI has to be an actual professor at the university. I don't know, thinking about maybe there's a relationship there with a community person that can, that can also be PIs. I mean, that's probably a huge political debate, but I'm just gonna put it out there. <laughs> um, I think that's probably all I have to, um, to add to this question. And I'm just going to respectfully sort of disagree with Carly in that um, there is a reluctance for Indigenous people to participate in academic research because um, 
there's a whole webinar series about um, you know unethical practices of research of the UC system, you know, and it's an entire conversation. I mean, having it's not been a good relationship, and so again, like that relationship has to be amended before even approaching a community who's willing to enter into a research project with the university. And the question always comes like, who owns the data? Like if it's a university, um, you know, there's a whole movement around data sovereignty and tribal communities owning their own data. And this comes after, you know, NAGPRA where we own our own bones and artifacts. Like this is, the, these are issues that are long standing that have not been resolved. So there's a lot of issues to contend with, but there are a lot of people in California working on this issue. And the other, there are extension agents that come directly from tribal communities. Um, and they've worked, they're working on creating spaces where tribal people can intersect with extension in respectable ways. You have tribal colleges who have their own extension agents. So these conversations are not isolated and it's not like we're starting new, like there are a lot of people in these spaces that have been working on these issues. And so I, I think part of this, this, after like contending with history of extension, the second part is looking at people who've been working in this space. And there are tribal extension agents that come from tribal colleges that have been working on making connections between extension and indigenous communities. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions that, we have questions that came in through the registration form and then we also have some in the Q and A. Um, so I think I'm going to switch to one from the registration form, um, which is kind of three questions in one. Um, this, uh, this question asks, um, I'm interested in learning about the appropriation of uh, irrigation agriculture by settlers, um, such as the claim that Spaniards introduced irrigation to Paiute tribes in the Owens River Valley, as well as how uh, cultural management can turn open space back into carefully tended working lands. And then, as, and they also want to know how to better support tribes through state healthy soils and invasive plant removal programs. That's a lot there. So I can add it to the chat if you want. <laughs> yes, that would be helpful. So I can see the questions one by one. Yes, and, please, just please add it to the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the question about Owens Valley. Um, if that, you know, like that is a very fascinating history and there's a lot of connections between um, that part of California and other um, agrarian co indigenous communities that go all the way down into the Southwest and all the way down into Mexico and North, like there is a whole era and contingent of communities that were practicing irrigation in very sophisticated ways prior to contact um, with, and you know, the Spanish have had a very distinct way of uh, acculturating and appropriating indigenous practices in order to support settlement in that part of the United States and it doesn't necessarily match up with um, the written history and the oral, oral histories are very different. Um, and it, it, it's a fascinating case study. And needless to say, Los Angeles wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the Owens Valley Paiute people and the other Paiute people in the area. Um, they made it possible for places like Los Angeles to actually become urban centers. Um, and I like I think that's a great history that could be taught through extension. Um, the other question was about how. Um, how cultural management can turn open space into carefully tended working lands. Um, again, that that's like a, I, I don't quite understand the question, like cultural management, like 
indigenous cultural management. And again, open space, I think, can be interpreted many different ways because what the agricultural community sees as open space may not necessarily be just open space. Like I think of the camas, for example, um, or I think about the firecracker lily or the mariposa lily. These are all open prairie plants that were carefully tended by indigenous people and were actually the heart of much of the food system in the prairies and open spaces where settlers and Western people didn't think there was any food or there was no like significant crops growing. But in fact, these were like carefully tended areas. Um, and they some of them still exist. So I think we should delve into that question a little more. So I please feel free to email me. And then um, Carly, if you're on, please feel free whenever I know I'm talking a lot. Yes, I'm here. I just had to turn off my video for well, we'll see how long I'm here with my baby. So um, and I'll try to show her to you all. <laughs> But I, I wanted to, I think that a day you really answered the question about the Owens River Valley. Um, just, yeah, I don't have anything more to add to that. Um, and just um, in terms of the question about how can cultural management um, turn open space back into carefully tended working lands? What This is a response to that. Um, I'm just thinking about the effort of the Ama Mutsin Land Stewardship Corps and so that's in Santa Cruz area. And, and I think this might be what this question is talking about. In that area, they've they've worked for years to make relationships and collaborations amongst the non the, the tribal nonprofit and um, Bay Area Open Space and um, the the Semper Viaments Fund. So what they've been doing is working with open space. Uh, council so that they can um, tend their cultural resources and see when I say things like cultural resources <laughs> that's just a very strange thing for me to say but I, I understand that that's the language that that we're working with and I, you know I, I haven't um, I haven't talked to them for a while but I do know that that's what they were working on and it, it and they would probably be better to say how that's working out for them than me but I, I would just Give a shout out to that community <laughs> and what they're doing um, over there in the Bay Area. Or actually, I'm sorry, the Monterey Bay Area, not the Bay Area. <laughs> and the, for the last question, um, the Healthy Soils and Invasive Plant Removal Program, one of the one of the main issues, well, there's there's like several issues with some of the programs that are coming up again nomenclature language is super super important if all of these legislative proposals have farmer and rancher um that is still pretty exclusionary like that means that tribal people and producers have unless they own a farm which very few people do in California there are a few people indigenous people who do like I I think of Palma who owns like huge acreages in in avocado i mean but they're probably one of the exceptions if the legislation language says farmer and rancher um solely that means that tribal people have to get creative to kind of figure out if or where they could fit into that space and so in having language that included tribal communities or people or even considerations um, when when writing that can is very, very important. And of course, outreach is really important. Most of the networks that I know, like the Intertribal Ag Council and NRCS tribal programs, um, Pedro, I know he's on, do a very good job of, of outreach to tribal communities. Um, but again, they're the exception. Like, so maybe Pedro can at NRCS USD may have better, or or um, Keir Johnson at IAC have have a better um, answer to how to do outreach to tribal communities with very institutional state or federal programming. Okay. Um. 
There is a question in the Q&A asking, how do we prevent extraction and exploitation of a successful indigenous system or practice? And that also ask, is this something we should be worried about? Um, yeah. Whoever wants to answer that first. I love that question. I don't know who answered that, but I love that question because like it, it helps me explain further. It forces me to explain further that when we're, we live in an extractive society, we live in a capitalist society where like we measure things in monetary value and um, with that system and institution, we carry language that supports that institution. For example, when we see successful models, we often say like, okay, how can we scale this? Or how can we use this model in other communities? Because it's part of this extractive system that we are a part of. And it takes a little bit of effort to unplug from that matrix, to unplug from that language, to recognize that we could actually think a little bit differently about how we're approaching the circumstances. And one of those ways is to look at indigenous communities. For one, we have over 200 microclimates in California. We have over and you know, 110 federally recognized communities, about 75 non-recognized communities, and numerous like not indigenous nonprofits and communities that aren't necessarily just one tribe. So there's like all of these micro climates and environments and communities in this in this place that even existed before colonization. And that means that like we can support that diversity and we can support these different ways of being and actually have them like successfully um, commingle with one another. It doesn't necessarily mean taking one model and plopping it in another community and like forcing them to like use that model, which is sort of what we see in agriculture. In agriculture, like we have all of these, and I, I work in philanthropy, we have all these RFPs that say, okay, we want to focus on these things. We want to focus on soil, water, and health. And, you know, sometimes it's kind of prescriptive. Like we want to have no-till practices. We want to, and I served on the Organic Standards Board for five years. We want no-till practices, you know, and that's not necessarily the right answer for everybody. We had conversations about agriculture, aquaculture. And, you know, I, I at that time I was living in Hawaii, like the conversation was completely different because they rely on aquaculture. So it's like, we have to recognize when we are um, substantiating extractive institutions, even if we don't mean to, and sometimes that scaling models that don't necessarily work in other places, but that's the exact kind of approach that agriculture loves to take. I think I'll just add to, to or pick up on something that you said a day, you said um, like the diversity in, in and I think that that's really critical to underscore and think about supporting the diversity of indigenous communities. You all heard those numbers that Ade said, 110 federally recognized tribes over, um, I, I'm sorry, and I don't remember how many state tribes you said, but in, innumerable um, nonprofits. And, 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 and we can think about that for the wider United States as well. There's like 592 federally recognized tribes in, num you know, in numerous tribal organizations and nonprofits and that there's a diversity there of tribal people. So we say Native American as sort of this term to refer to a really diverse group of people and, and the same for indigenous um, as well. You know, we use a general term, but there's very specific tribes and tribal people. Um, and and I, I wanna make sure we said that today or that I said that today um, so that, that uh, more people can start thinking about the diversity of tribes and tribal people and indigenous and indigenous people. And um, 
and I think that will help <laughs> that that may help um, avoiding uh, a pro cultural appropriation and things like that. Thank you. Yeah, that's so important to keep in mind. Um, I know that you've both kind of touched on this in your answers to the previous questions, but we do have a question in the Q and A um, asking: In order to assess needs for the purpose of program development, uh, so in order to assess needs for the purpose of program development, how can cooperative extension um, develop trust with the tribal people, and how do you? advise to go about doing that? And I know you had mentioned some things, um, but if you want to expand it anymore, feel free. Yeah. Stephanie, you paused for just a second. Do you oh, mind putting that oh, no. in, in, in chat for me? It might've yeah. been just my end. It might've been, it might've been mine as well. Um, yeah, I can put it in the chat for sure. Did, um, Carly, were you able to hear me or did I cut out for everyone? I think I heard most of it. Okay. Um, and I guess like to really, I feel like to really answer this question, I, I could answer it in a general way, but it seems like for me to really answer it, I would want to know what, how, how do you assess the needs of the program development? Those kinds of questions, like those are what's coming up. I don't know how you do that. So I, I don't know if I'd be able to offer you know, I, I think it's a really good question and it deserves more in depth as far as what I can think right now, it's how I would answer it. I would have questions <laughs> to the person that asked it <laughs> or want to say a discussion. little bit or there's like a, a thing in, you know, UC Cooperative Extension where we also do it as a statewide program to some extent, but county people especially are supposed to do this needs assessment and that's the term that's used. And so it's about going to the people who are supposed to be your clientele and often they do surveys or go out and talk with them to find out how should, you know, how should this extension person direct their outreach program to help the person with their needs, the farmers and whoever else they consider their clientele. And so those are kind of the terms that are used and there's annual reporting required and things like that. So that's kind of, I think, what this person is asking about, if, if I'm interpreting that correctly. That sounds so. about right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an awesome question because t-shirts, 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 Indian people love t-shirts. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, but for like a real answer, like we have to do this at First Nations because we serve, tribal communities across the mainland, Alaska, and Hawaii. And so for us, before we start looking out, we have to start looking in. And that means that we have to hire indigenous people who know these communities well enough so that they can one, know exactly who to ask. If you're asking some random person with a survey, you're probably gonna get a very different answer than this person who's from that community actually having a conversation with like in a group setting. I mean, so like the, the practical ways of, of implementing a survey affect what kind of data you get back or what kind of information you get back. But it's much easier if you have, in, if you have people who know those communities. So like there's very few indigenous extension agents like that needs to be addressed like and um there's very few like non-white extension agents i know some of you are out there and you there's many battles that we all have to face but like that's important so changing looking internally and changing the face of who you're sending out to get the information is really important and not every community can be reached but a large majority of them can't and you know Indian country is really really small like we know each other like we have connections we I always say there's at least like just two degrees of separation from any any Indian person in this country like there are relationships that can be traced back for generations and even, like we can ask about each other so it's it's like when you have one indigenous extension agent that person knows two others who could possibly be extension agents. So it's really important before we start looking to 
assess what needs are outside of the organization to look internally and assess what can you do inside to make sure you're getting information that is helpful. All right, are, is, do you wanna expand any more on that Carly or do you wanna move on? Okay, thank you so much. That was so helpful. Um, I think we have time to answer at least one more question. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, the next question is from uh, one that someone submit, submitted in the registration form. Um, the question is, some tribes within my service area do not have the same capacity that larger tribes who own uh, large tracts of land. How is the be what is the best way to interact with tribes that may currently not have as strong of a connection to their tribe's historical management activities due to the history of oppression and lack of land ownership? And, and how to balance asking questions about indigenous knowledge uh, and balance that with providing technical as assistance in a respectful way? I'm not sure if I cut out. Let me know if you missed any part of that. <laughs> I got some of that. Um, Carly, I will take this and then you jump in. So um, yes, 10 minutes, because I love telling stories, short stories. So there's an indigenous community who was in a lawsuit for a national preserve. They wanted access to their traditional homelands. Um, and in order to do that, they had to challenge the legal ownership history that that created this national preserve. And I was listening to the, the trial and the depositions. And one of the questions was like, okay, okay, tribal leader, you haven't been in possession of this land for over a hundred years. And there's fences all around this national preserve that says no trespassing and you're claiming you want this back now, like you've been disconnected. How, how, how do you maintain connections when you see all these signs with no trespassing and it hasn't been in your possession for over a hundred years? And the tribal leader said, oh, those fences? I thought those were to keep the animals in. I didn't necessarily think they were created to keep the Indians out. And I just like, thought that was hilarious because even the way we view fences is very different. And so when we talk about like non-access, that's an issue because more than likely indigenous people are practicing stewardship practices in places they probably shouldn't. And I'm giving no names and I will never tell them, but like people get access to some of their traditional gathering grounds, even though it's not in their possession, because there's a they're very distinct way that indigenous people practice like ownership and it's fluid. Sometimes it's bound by time, it's bound by gathering season. And then some other ind indigenous community will come in after that and they're still considered owners. So the way ownership is viewed is very different. So like not having access is sometimes assumed despite, you know, despite the fences. The other thing is like, there are organizations, like no matter, again, I mentioned the tribal historic preservation officer. If you don't know who that is, they're really important because even if there's a landless tribe, they still have a tribal historic preser preservation officer who most likely maintains all the records of the ancestral homelands of that community. And they are actually called out when um, development happens within their ancestral home territory, even if it's not within their ownership. So like the Tribal Historic Preservation Office is always a good place to start. And secondly, there's nonprofit intermediaries that probably are working with different tribes. Like I think of the California Tribal Fund, we're working with many different tribal communities to gain access, legal access to some of their lands. And then like the California Indian Basket Weavers Association has a lot of members that are from tribes, landless tribes or tribes that are not recognized so they don't have access. But the conversations, even though there's not legal ownership of these tribes are still happening and the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. 
this is just making me think too just like about um, just having patience and, and, and learning about the local people in your area and just you know meeting them where meeting them where they're at and, and I, I think that's what we do in any relationship that we're building i hope and that's all that i would add okay we have about five minutes left i'm kind of tempted to ask one more question but I'm not sure. What do you all think? <laughs> Are we good to go a little, little tiny bit longer? Okay. Um, so um, this last question is uh, many tribal organizations participate in federally funded food assistance programs, and yet the nutrition guidelines and food and beverages provided in those programs don't always accurately reflect the culturally appropriate foods and beverages or um, that are, or they are not produced in alignment with indigenous approaches. Uh, what steps could be taken to better align these federal nutrition and food assistance programs with tribal participants, cultural preferences and practices? And is there a role for extension professionals to play in that process? Yes, I think definitely, there's definitely a role. And I'm just thinking about the, I think the 2018 Farm Bill is still really rolling out. And I believe in that Farm Bill, there's been some language so that, um, that nutrient, like, for example, getting um, American Indian vendors approved and, and approving indigenous foods as part of that, uh, as part of those programs that people can buy from and those kinds of things. And I think a day had some more to add. <laughs> well, this 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 is like what what Carly was talking about research. I said, like, yes, tribes are hesitant to participate in research, but that shouldn't stop extension agents from trying. And this is where Carly's point about research really makes sense, because we do need to challenge how the nutrition field influences federal policy. Like when we think about, oh my gosh, the pyramid, you know, the my plate, all of those things are based on very outdated ideas about nutrition. And um, so I, I wrote a paper on this when we talked about like the health um, and it's called fighting for the taste buds of our children. Um, you know, part of the nutrition policy that was established way back in the late 19th century, early 20th century, came at a very important time in this country. It came like at a time of war. It came at a time where technology, the industrial revolution was just happening. And, you know, some of, and it was created to address like starvation that was happening in this country in order to prepare people to go to war. And so like nutrition policy has some ties and has some roots in not only industrial industrialization, but militarization. And some of those nutrition policies and ideas have yet to be challenged. And we see some of those, like you think about farm to school programs, you think about, um, you know, the the social service programs which are also big after the depression era like we see some of these programs that kind of get like the can gets kicked down further and further and further and it's like at some point we have to take some time to really think about nutrition policy and the makeup of our country and what the goals are of this century because some of them are just like carry on traditions that have been inherited without being questioned. Um, I'll put the link to the paper I wrote about this in, in, in the chat, but extension has a critical role in this. Like we need more research that looks at how nutrition is connected to land and environment because people like to separate those things and how those things are connected to people like this is a field that's ripe for research I think there's so many knowledgeable indigenous people can, that can help here it's going to be hard there's reluctance but we should have those conversations okay thank you both so much um it is three o'clock so I think we want to start wrapping up we are adding the link to the feedback survey in the chat, and we'll also send that out in email afterward, but we want to make sure you can access that now. 
Um, please do fill that out to let us know what you learned today and how we can improve. Um, I also want to mention our next webinar is on Friday, October 15th from 1.30 to 3 o'clock p.m. And that session will be focused on the contributions and leadership of farmers of color in sustainable agriculture. Um, and we are adding the registration link for that to the, to the chat as well. Um, and uh, so, so to sum things up, Ade and Carly, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, it's an honor to learn from you. You're leaving with us with, you're leaving us with a lot to think about. And, um, and I hope that everyone um, took something that they can use from this session. Sonia, would you like to add anything before we, before we uh, conclude or? No, just wanted to say thank you to both Carly and Ade. Just, yeah, really, really appreciate your time and your insights. <laughs> thank you. It's incredibly important perspectives. Thank you it's so much. It's an honor. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Okay, um, so everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.